Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitemout.com, Bitemoutlive.com, and P.O. Combs Asian Art in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and today is October 20th. It's a Wednesday, 2021, and this week we're gonna, I'm going to talk about a, a sale and a, 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 an event that's happening over in London around the 1st and the 2nd of November at Bonhams. And if you're if, if, if you're not going to be over there, you can you can see a lot of it online here. We're going to we'll talk about where the catalogs are and so forth. It's a very interesting uh, a couple of sales they're having, and an interesting event has. Uh, and all of this is tied uh, very nicely into the the history of collecting in London at that uh, back in the early part of the 20th century. How it got started, who the some of the pioneer collectors were, what they found, and uh, we're going to go through it. It's it's a, sort of an interesting thing. And if you want to see the catalogs that I'm talking about, you come over to the uh, over to bit them out here. You know, every, most of you know where it is. Just scroll down here to the books and references. Click that brings you over here, and they're all on this page. And on here, there are three auction catalogs and one exhibition catalog. And the exhibition catalog is absolutely fascinating, but this auction catalog is also absolutely fascinating uh, because of the history of the objects, how they came to be there, and all that stuff. Okay, and we're going to get to it. Of course, they have their regular Asian art sale, which is worth certainly worth checking out if you're if you're a, a, a collector or a dealer. Um, as you know, Bonhams puts together some pretty good buyable lots and nice things in in all price ranges from you know five or six hundred, eight hundred pounds up to you know whatever up, up to big numbers but they put together generous lots and if you're a dealer you can you can you can work with them and, and probably make some money with them all right and there's some nice nice examples as always and the estimates and the reserves always on these sales always tend to be rather low because they're there to sell it they don't want to keep it they got to get it out of there they have to you know handle their clients and uh you're in a pretty good position when it comes to buying all right, and then there's the Fine Chinese Works of Art Sale, which is also excellent. Some very good things, a great cover lot and all that. And then coming over to uh, this, uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about was they're, they're doing a show. This is not an auction. This is a show, an exhibition of the collection of Reginald and Lena Palmer. All right, and, and um, they were members of the Oriental Ceramic Society up until about 1970. This was a couple that began collecting in the early uh, 20th century, um, of 19, 1920s, down in that area. And they bought some absolutely stupendous things. Here's the back of the catalog. But what's really interesting about this catalog is there's an extensive write-up at the beginning about these two, about, uh, about uh, uh, Reginald and Lena Palmer. And it, the uh, it, the uh, article, the main body of the article about them was written by Colin Sheaf. And Colin Sheaf is the head of the Chinese Asian department at Bonhams. He's a former Christie's guy. He's been around forever. And there aren't many people that know as much about Chinese art as Colin Sheaf. And he knows the history of these early collectors. These are the, the like some of the early core members of the Oriental Ceramic Society in England, which was formed in the, around uh, January 31st, 1921 and uh, how they started with just 12 members. There were no dealers allowed because uh, it was supposed to be purely uh, for, for the collecting purist. And um, they would meet in each other's homes um, uh, you know, on regular schedules and then share the things that they had bought and, and discuss them because there wasn't a lot r known at that time. Hobson hadn't quite yet written his book yet, though he was a member of the society. Uh, 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 but, but there wasn't a lot written, so they had to, they had to do a lot of discussion and examination and share the information, a lot of it done verbally um, and, and based on opinions of the time. And they were primarily focused, uh, a lot of it was focused on bringing out of China things that were discovered while the railroads were, for example, being put in. And they dug up and they hit all these tombs, hundreds of thousands of tombs. And they would come up with all kinds of pottery shards and, and uh, uh, ritual vases and all this early stuff. And they were focused primarily on ceramics, but uh, over the years, obviously, they got interested in other things. Uh, when Eumorphopolis came in, uh, he, he was allowed to join around 1930, 1933, and he, he brought in other, uh, broad, broadened their interest into bronzes and jades and other things. 
And then eventually they allowed dealers to join around 1933 also, interestingly. And basically you could pay a, you pay a, a modest uh, uh, annual dues, you could join. And uh, uh, companies like Spinks and Blewitts and their people joined, um, uh, which, was, which was considered rather unusual because they were dealers. They were making money in this, and this was supposed to be for the purest art collector. But they wanted to expand it, and I, and I think they, they realized there was no harm in it, so they went ahead and did it. And this is the story of the Perry fa um, of the uh, Palmer family, and how they went on and collected, and goes through uh, how, when they bought things, what they paid for them, who they were with, uh, their relationships with uh, other famous collectors of the day, how they got to meet, and a lot of them made friendships and relationships by going to these big dealers, by going to Spinks, by going to Blewitts, by, uh, by 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 making their purchases, and the dealers got them linked together. And it was it was it was a it was a fairly small network of people, but they were all enthusiasts, and and, that, and this is where it grew. And of course, it all culminated in 1935 and 1936 with the famous Burlington House exhibition that was organized by uh, by Percival David and Hobson and these guys. They got together and they organized that fantastic show, um, the the famous Red Book of of, of, of you know that was published. Uh, I have a copy of it here somewhere. I can't find it at the moment, but it's here. And um, there's lots and lots of information in here. And then there is some uh, Oriental Ceramic Society exhibition catalogs with things in them um, uh, that are illustrated here. And these are things that had um, belonged to the Palmer family. And they go down through them. Just absolutely great stuff all the way through. And what's the most amazing is, is when you see what they paid for the things, you know, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 30 pounds, 50 pounds. You know, they mentioned in here there's, there was a day when somebody spent, I think it was 362 pounds at Sphinx, and everybody thought it was such an amazing deal. What a huge transaction. And I think about it relative to the prices today. It seems, it seems, it seems odd, <laughs> all right. And then get on to this: the Perry collection. Uh, this is the uh, collection of uh, Edmund Perry, uh, Edward, Edward Arthur Perry, rather. He was born in 1879. He died in 1946, and he was an avid collector. He did most of his collecting in the 19, a lot of it in the 1920s, and he bought all of it from from a fairly small group of people. But what's great about this catalog is that uh, within it, uh, if you scroll through the thing, uh, you get over here to the beginning, and they have some very nice illustrations of, of he and his wife, Angelina, when they were uh, 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 getting married. And here's, here's uh, 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 David, Sir Percival David here, preparing for the Burlington House exhibition. And uh, they all knew uh, Mr. Perry. He was not an early member of the society, and he wasn't, uh, they were mostly interested in ceramics. This is the funniest thing. They were all interested primarily in ceramics and early ceramics. Imperial ceramics were not that well understood stood at this time. They, they, were work, they were focusing most of their attention on Tang and Sung and Liao, Yuan and Ming porcelains. And um, uh, uh, Ch Qing ceramics were understood and known, but they weren't pursued as heavily. They weren't being chased as hard as they are certainly today, or nor valued anywhere near um, uh, proportionally what they are today. And um, the, the, uh, the Perrys didn't, didn't care about any of that. They bought only what they liked. They bought the things that they really, really, really liked, and they had very good taste, and they had the wherewithal so they could buy whatever they wanted. And they bought a lot of things from, from uh, 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 Spink and Sons. And uh, here's, a, here's a picture, this is interesting, of Captain Liddell. He was a, a, a Brit that was in China, and he was supplying um, um, Spinks and um, uh, so forth with goods. This is the famous Burlington House um, uh, Royal Academy exhibition catalog that had thousands of things in it, thousands of things in it. It's quite a book. And um, they had six things from the Perry collection in that catalog, which was quite something at the time, um, though it wasn't that well understood uh, what, the, what they had. They referred to things. But the thing that was really interesting was the receipts. The, the Perrys kept their invoices, which is something a lot of us are guilty of not doing, myself included. And uh, in here you'll find um, uh, uh, all kinds of receipts from um, um, Spink and Sons, Yamanaka and Company, Vickery, Bluets, you name it. And it's in here. They don't have receipts for every single piece, but they have a lot of them. 
and uh, they're all in here. And of course, this is all going to be fertile ground for the people out there that do auctions and sell fakes. They're going to be studying to death these things. I'm glad they didn't print them too big. And then further into the catalog of the Perry auction, they have the the Burlington House catalog itself excerpted with the items that are being offered in the sale, like this cloisonne screen here. It's here, this entry, the, the uh, enamel vase from the Imperial Palace, the, uh, this one, and then the, fa the cover lot, which is this uh, melon form, Chinlung Markin period uh, teapot, and on and on. It goes through all the pieces that were lent to the Burlington House exhibition are there, and then you get into the main part of the auction itself. And it's interesting because in here are things that are buyable for people, even if you're, if you're not you know, extremely wealthy, but you want to own something with impeccable provenance that comes from the day when these pieces, these core collections, sort of the ground zero of, 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 of Chinese art collecting and interest really was starting the first 20, 30 years. Uh, this, this, this is a, a, your opportunity to do that. <clears throat> and these opportunities, this doesn't happen that often. It happens fairly rarely, you know. Um, so so keep, keep that in mind. But there's some awfully nice looking things with reasonable estimates, okay? This was bought, uh, this was bought from L.J.C. Vickery, London, in August 1924. This is a very nice 19th century cloisonne bowl with uh, mythical beasts and dragons and so forth going around it. I, by the shape, it looks like an alms bowl to me. It's about eight inches in diameter with an 800 to 1200 pound estimate, and, but, but with great provenance absolutely great now will it go for that those estimates i suspect it'll go for a bit over it but if you could get it for under three or four thousand pounds with that track record that history uh, i don't think it's a bad buy i think it's, it makes it makes it part of it makes it a very interesting part of a collection and then also the month cups so these were the, the number of the porcelains the best porcelains they bought they bought from the the, the fellow uh, captain liddell that i mentioned a, a minute ago uh he, he he was supplying spinks with things and um this was a, one of the Kangxi month cups, and in the in the book, I think it said he paid. They paid ten dollars for these, or ten pounds for these back in the day. Uh, they were bought in. Uh, they were they were part of an exhibition in uh, June 1929, right before the crash, and. Uh, they, yeah, Captain Charles uh, Charles Oswald Liddell, right here. Here it is. <clears throat> and he died in 1941. Mr. Perry died in 1946, just a few years later. And it talks about it was part of the Liddell collection of old Chinese porcelain London. That's how they would blew it, would market them. And um, But he was really over there buying stuff, building a collection so he could sell it. He was also a collector, but there was a little bit of uh, old school marketing in there and then on to this a pair of um, young chen or kangxi period uh femi ver uh li, li bai wine cups they do, and they don't know whether these are kangxi or young chen because of the, the work could be from either they, they look young chen to me but that's just my personal uh, opinion uh, they're not marked and uh, the only history is it just says they were in the perry collection uh, they don't know when these were bought. There's not much known about them. With a twenty to thirty thousand pound estimate, or twenty-eight to forty-one thousand dollars. So it'll be interesting to see what they bring. They could they could do very very well because of the style, the cup. And uh, on to this, uh, one of the nicest pieces of lacquer in the sale is this uh, cover, extremely rare um, uh, uh, Chanchi lacquer covered plum blossom picnic box set with cover on a stand. This isn't a big thing. This is about eight inches in diameter, but uh, absolutely wonderful. And uh, let's uh, get it to load. I want to show you this. This, this is what it looks like when you open it up. You slip this cover off, and in it, within it is this. This box is an inner liner, and uh, and then it, it fits also. This this section here closes and fits on top of this, and then this goes over that. So it has a t double in you know double interior section with a lid. Uh, but beautiful lacquer work inside and out. Look at look at the condition of this lacquer. It's as fresh. It looks as fresh as the day it was made. Absolutely beautiful tiny 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 bits of wear from the cover being taken on and uh, put on and taken off but that's about it just to examine for occasionally I suppose but uh, the workmanship on this is superb and it's Chen Lung period and it's estimated uh, you know it's right up there 60 to 80 thousand pounds but very very rare and this was the kind of stuff that the, the Perry's really really liked they loved enamels they loved lacquer they liked they liked carvings and they liked things that were just intrinsically beautiful regardless of where it came from 
And then on to this, the big gun in the sale, of course, is this, the Chimlung Markin period melon form uh, teapot, estimated at five to 800,000 pounds. Uh, but extremely rare, very beautiful, and it was described in the uh, in the Burlington House catalog as just Canton enamel. That's all it was. They didn't say Imperial Chin Lung. They didn't say that it was made in the Imperial Workshop because they didn't know. This is the thing that's interesting. Back in those days, they really didn't know where these were made. They didn't have a lot of information to go by. Um, uh, today, they, they know because they've dug out the papers, they've done all the research, but back then, they, you, you, you were you know, winging a prayer buying. And uh, I love the seal mark, the four character Chin Lung mark within this rather rococo looking uh, cartouche with a dragon on top. It's a very unusual framing and very attractive. And um, like I said, estimated at 500 to 800,000 pounds or uh, 690 to 1.1 million dollars US. But um, go find another one. You know, it's one of those deals. And he bought it in September uh, 30th, 1925. Mr. Perry bought that from, from Spinks. Again, Spink and Sons, okay? He was their big customer, it seems. And, uh, or one of his, they, they had a lot of big customers. He was just one of them, I guess. But anyway, and then yeah, they had another piece of enamel that they bought, uh, also uh, probably done at the Imperial Atelier in Beijing, this beautiful vase. Uh, it's about, I think it's about eight or nine inches tall, but exceptional quality, great color, and in nice condition, and exhibited at Burlington House. And uh, let's see, it, it was uh, six, oh, it's six and a half inches tall, it's a little smaller. Um, estimated uh, at 30 to 50,000 pounds, it was bought in August of 1924. And... Um, there's a very good extensive write-up of uh, other examples and um, uh, pieces that were it was exhibited for over over different times, and there's, there's a whole lot of information on here about it. It's, it's, it's all good reading. And then onto this, this was another pair of interesting porcelains. These are also bought in from uh, Captain Liddell, a uh, pair of Yongshan Markin period Famille Rose decorated drag covered dragon balls. And uh, these are absolutely beautiful. The one on the left is uh, uh, painted, uh, you notice they use this shade of blue and then a, a slightly greenish shade of blue here. But what I liked about them a lot was the, it was the, the, the expression on the dragons' faces. They look like very happy dragons. Uh, uh, sometimes Ch Qing dragons to me look to be a little bit ferocious. Um, these look like, like they're really happy to be there. And uh, I just love them. Uh, and beautiful white porcelain, of course, and you know they they, they sit on the, they have these shaped uh, shaped uh, covers with Yong Chen marks, of course, and uh, they, these were bought from uh, as it said Captain Oswald in June of 1929, and they were part of that collection, the old collection collection the Liddell collection of old Chinese porcelain. So they came from the same sale as the other one. So the Perry showed up and they bought some serious stuff that day. And then on to this, a pair of very rare imperial inscribed cinnabar lacquer carved tea bowls. Beautiful quality and in pristine condition. And estimated at 100 to 150,000 pounds. And the, the, all they know about these is they're just in the family collection. But this is what they were known to buy. So the chances are they probably did buy them from Spinks or from Blewitz or somewhere. And they just didn't have the receipt. They couldn't find the receipt for it but a, a really superb pair of lacquer, two-color lacquer bowls. Very, very rare. And then on to the bronzes. Uh, this, Xuandi marked uh, uh, early Qing bronze, 17th to 18th century, uh, you know, possibly transitional to Kangxi, somewhere in there. But great quality with Arabic across the bottom. That's what's really unusual. It's an archaistic body up here. We've seen the, these, these late Ming bronzes, Ming bronzes, early Qing bronzes with archa uh, Arabic script on them. Here they have an archaistic uh, uh, panel running across the front. And then the Arabic is down below here, praising uh, uh, Muhammad as the one God. But uh, there is what one God, Muhammad, is what it says, basically. And uh, notice the quality of the, uh, the, the casting. Uh, that classic, uh, you know, uh, early, early Qing, very, very high quality uh, workmanship. We, we, we've seen some bronzes like these in the past. They do very, very well uh, because the workmanship is so superior. And uh, here you have this elegant stepped banded ring base with gilt splashes on them. But the patina is just great. This very warm patina, this very detailed um, low relief archaistic workmanship, and then this very 
beautifully kicked out flared rim not too far not too short just just right perfect and this is a good size bronze it's 12 inches in diameter which makes it quite nice that's a nice big bronze 15 to 20,000 pounds or 20 21 to 28 thousand dollars but what a great thing and this one was uh, just within the family collection in the Perry family collection like I said they they obviously bought it probably from one of the big dealers and they just didn't keep the receipt Andy all right and then this is one of the major lots in the sale also is this uh, really rare tip pair of um, uh, Kingfisher uh, uh, screens they're about 45 inches tall they're pretty big with lapis um, uh, s s carving in them here let's blow these up these are just stupendously pretty uh, there we go here we are uh, just a great mountain landscape scene done like a classical painting uh, with, the, with the blue rocks and then they inked it in here and they used the natural color in the stone also in, the, in the, it looks like in, in uh, to, to highlight and so forth and you know there's there's a mother I mean there's a, 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 a kingfisher feathers laid in and then colored but these 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 beautiful carving of the clouds how the clouds are floating uh, in this the, they did the stone carving of the clouds floating through through the mountains all the way down through the pine trees and then there's a there's a figure here uh, and another figure here crossing the bridge and then down below and you have these big scholar rocks in lapis in, on a zetan frame, by the way, this is the whole frame is zetan, beautifully carved zetan wood, and uh, it, this was exhibited at Burlington House, uh, Chinlung period, uh, 170 to 250 thousand dollars. But you know, go find another pair. You want those, and these are big. These are good size. But then they have other things here, like this little apple green jade box, covered paste box. Um, uh, reasonably estimated 2500 to 3500 pounds uh this was uh just in the in the family collection they don't know really over probably don't they probably had it on a on the bookcase somewhere in the house but it's a very nice piece of jade with good provenance and then on to this this was bought at spinx uh this very very rare uh uh in uh, two color lacquer uh brush pot on on its stand on its original with its or built into its stand and uh, this was bought from spink and sons in april of 1961. this was oh this was bought by gerald um uh this was the son and he continued to collect uh, for about a decade and a half after his father died. He was equally interested in, the, in, 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 in Chinese art. And he bought this, and he continued his relationship with Spinks. And he bought this uh, about 60, year, 50, 60 years ago. It's been a while. <laughs> All right. And, uh, but beautiful, beautiful quality. All right, and then on to this, this uh, very, very fine soapstone. Um, this is the Ode to the Red Cliffs, the, the famous story. There's a number of inscriptions on this piece of stone, estimated 40 to 60,000 pounds, uh, but very rare, very fine quality carving. Uh, here you have the figures in the boat. There's an inscription here. There's a signature from the artist, but beautifully polished, absolutely superbly polished all the way around. Um, the bottom of it, we can get it to load. Uh, sometimes these, the bottom page takes a little while. Oh, there it is, with some uh, uh, some calligraphy there on the bottom, and then the back of it has tr has bamboo trees and uh, a little house, a little a little scholar's house tucked into the mountains. Uh, just absolutely wonderful. And this isn't a big carving. This is small, two or three inches high, uh, four inches, four and a half inches tall, but su superb quality, uh, Perry collection. And then on to this. This is something that is just marked Perry collection as well, but it's really nice, and it's you know eight to twelve hundred pounds. Is this great little archaistic smoky rock quartz crystal bell, uh, but beautifully carved, uh, low relief carving, uh, you know all around. Just a nice little thing, a few inches tall. But what a great little object! And it's, a, and a, and it's a stone bell. How often do you see those? And then they get back to at the end of the sale, they have some big lots come in. Um, this really fine imperial Chinlung uh, red uh, two color lacquer uh, uh, teapot, uh, estimated at 96 to $170,000 or 70 to 120,000 pounds, depending on what currency you're favored. And uh, here's the workmanship on this. Uh, notice that you have to really look, you spend some time, if you want to learn about lacquer, this is a great chance to do it because the uh, quality of these photographs when enlarged really give you all of the details 
of the carving and the lacquer and how they did it. And you begin to really understand how fine the workmanship was when they went to work at the uh, Imperial Lacquer Factory and what the things that they could produce, things like this. You know, fit for an emperor. Just absolutely beautiful all the way around. All the way around. Classical form, spectacularly well carved. Uh, and estimated accordingly, ninety-six to one hundred seventy thousand dollars, or seventy to one hundred twenty thousand pounds. And then, but then you come back, and they have things like this. This was bought from Spink and Sons. Is this beautiful powder blue with gold um, Kangxi vase? Absolutely beautiful piece of porcelain. Beautiful color. This is a great color. Um, it, 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 even it's warm. Um, very, very, very nice with this uh, very fine gilding on it. And the gilding all looks to be in terrific condition, pretty much. I mean, there's a little tiny bit of wear down here, but that's it. All of it looks fine. The bird, the flowers, and all that. And this very nice um, uh, silver inlaid, uh, possibly Zeton lid. I don't know if they tell you what, what the lid is made out of in the description. Uh, so I just say silver inlaid wood cover. Okay, they don't say it's Z10. So if they don't say it's Z10, it's not Z10. It's just a very fine dark wood, and it was bought by uh, Mr. Perry in 1923 from Spinks. Also, imagine going into Spinks back then. Holy mackerel! It must have been something. And uh, and then on to this. This was uh, from the Liddell collection again from that exhibit and show back in 1929. Is this uh, uh, figure of the Guan Yin, 18th century female rose, eight or nine inches tall, but beautiful quality. Looks to be in very very good shape. There's a tiny bit of enamel loss down here on the skirt. I think there was probably there was often there's a problem with this kind of enameling on a smooth surface and sometimes it peels and it looks like this is just peeling. I don't think it's damaged. I think it's just the enamel's peeled off of it. The fingers look pretty good. You know, if you're interested in it, make sure the fingertips are okay. That's always an issue on these things. But overall it's a beautiful thing. The the pale pink sort of, you know, lining the robe going onto the floor and all that. And the beautiful, the beautiful downcast eyes, sort of demure look of the of the Kuan Yin, beautifully done, and uh, four to six thousand pounds, or fifty five hundred to six thousand or eight thousand dollars U.S. But very rare, very nice, and it is nine and a half inches tall. All right, and that's sort of a, a, a rough look at uh, some of it. This is not the entire sale. This is just a, you know, a, a dozen and a half of I think you know some of the interesting things that caught my eye. But uh, the whole sale is interesting. It's all stuff from this family's collection, and these kind of collections don't turn up very often. So you do want to check it out. And uh, as far as this other sale, the exhibit goes, go go read up on it. And if you're going to be in London, by all means, go see this. I think it's it's on view. Um, um, it's on view from October 25th through November 2nd, and. Um, you may see this stuff come up for auction in a year or so. Sometimes the auction houses, they do little trial balloons with old collections to see how the, how the people that come to preview the other auctions, they go in and look at this. They, they gauge the temperature of the room, so to speak, to see how much interest there is. And I flipped through this catalog, and I, I would think there'd be a lot of interest in this stuff. Even though a number of auctions happened 40, 50, 60 years ago, of other things from the Palmer collection. Um, they certainly didn't sell everything and they certainly held back some of the very finest pieces. So, um, uh, wisely. And um, we'll see where that all ends up. But but it's an interesting combination uh, of, of the actual sale and then uh, getting to see that material and then seeing the Palmer material. So it's a great draw. Go, go in there and see it if you're in the London area. It's worth it. It's worth it. Absolutely fun. All right, make a day of it. All right, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, leave a thumbs up. Uh, we'll be back Friday with our regular video. Leave a comment, subscribe if you haven't done so already. We, we would like to have you as a subscriber. Hit the little notification bell so you, you know when we uh, put up our next video. And um, have a great rest of your week. All right, bye-bye.